Good afternoon, everybody. Good evening. The topic that came from uh, you is how to involve members in mission. So that's what we will look at. You have no, you have heard the quotation often misattributed to Albert Einstein. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So when we ask, why do we need to talk about this? The simple answer is because what we have does not work. So our traditional approach to involving church members in witnessing is uh, not working well. And that's why we either try to use different tactics and that is to bribe people and we can bribe them with different things. You know, if you do this, then you will have a star in your crown, then you will be saved, you go to heaven. Or if that does not work, then we try to scare people. If you don't do this, then don't even think that you are going to be saved. Then imagine that God will ask for uh, the soul of that people on the day of uh, judgment from you. I mean, Satan says in the book of Job, no one would serve you because of love. Uh, if anyone serves you, it's only because they are sore. Uh, either you bribe them like Job or you scare them. And so these are the two motivations that are used uh, so often, even by religious people. Back to Victoria's question, no, people feel that we are not interested in them, we are not caring, we only pretend because we are trying to bribe them because we want to win them. And uh, we are the best ones to answer that by showing that that's not the case. We are really caring. The result of this is battery operated Christianity. You need always someone to kick you. So you have a week of prayer, you have a great speaker, you, have a, you hear a good sermon, and they say, yeah, something needs to be done. And then you get involved in evangelism, involved in other local church ministry. And of course, uh, that overspills to your spiritual life. So you hear a good sermon, you read a good book, you get all agitated, and then you come, you just, the batteries die down and up and down, up and down. And of course, often it works like that in marriages, not only in spiritual life. And this is based on misunderstanding of the picture of God, who God is, God's character. This is uh, based on the misunderstanding of the times in which we live. So you feel that, okay, if we do what we did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, then it's a good way of uh, involving people in mission. And it's a misunderstanding of the work of the Holy Spirit, as uh, Karen mentioned uh, regarding uh, telling people the truth that we feel we will do a better work than the Holy Spirit because that's convicting people of the truth is the work of the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, and the role of spiritual gifts. Notice this is not because we are bad Christians. It's just because we have not thought through what we are supposed to do, what is our task and what is our role. And that's why we feel that if we just operate like this, then that's what it's supposed to be. And so, how do we do it differently? The key thought is here that if we have nothing to share, we will want to lead others to experience the same. And so if people feel, yeah, but I don't have anything that anybody is interested in, of course, then you are not going to involve them in any mission. So what percentage of our members experience a growing relationship with Jesus as his followers? You know, Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. What percentage of our members experience or have the joy of assurance of salvation? And so if you don't feel you have something to share, you are not going to share it with others. Is it possible that before we start working on evangelizing others, we should work on our members first? And also, if we do not know what we have, will we be able to share it effectively with others? For a significant number of our people, their salvation is somehow connected with the level of sanctification achieved before the close of probation. 
so they are more concerned with themselves and uh, neurotic am i going to survive the investigative judgment they are not so much interested about other people and because uh, Christianity has been defined in dogmatic terms for the last uh, 1500 years. They just somehow believe that because we keep the Sabbath, don't eat pork and pay the tithe, we are okay because we have the right fundamental beliefs. And they are not very much concerned with being involved. And being involved then only means to tell them the truth. So you share a book, you know, the more explicit about the truth, the better. You share a tract, you tell them, oh, but you are doing these things wrong. So if you want to be saved, you better shape up. How authentic and effective is going to be their witnessing and their evangelism, if this is the model from which they work. And even those who do not struggle with perfectionism, which many of our members do, often do not have a clue what are the needs of people around them because they never listened, they never asked, they never researched it. So they assume that they know what are the needs, but they just project what they have been told or what they feel they should be their needs. What percentage of our members know what is their spiritual gift or what is their evangelistic style? Because nobody taught them that. And so they just live on the tradition that whatever they have heard the loudest in the past, this is what they are supposed to do. So what is the way forward? This is the reality. The forward is to rethink or redefine discipleship. We need to redefine and rethink evangelism. And we need to redefine and rethink the whole process. So let's start with the discipleship. Discipleship is the process, so no, notice this is something that is a process through which individuals who have received new life from above, who have been converted, who have been born again, take on the character or put on the character of Jesus Christ by combination of grace and effort. So we are followers of Jesus. He wants to share his character with us, but it will take grace from him and effort on our part. As Peter said it, grow in the grace of knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it takes the form of an increase in the degree to which our lives are dominated by God's grace. So God is acting in our life. So grace is the fuel on which Christians run. And also knowledge to have an interactive relationship with God. Where in my life God is working these days? What is the wave that I need to surf so that I am in touch with God? So it's not a matter of behaving in a certain way, but being inwardly and thoroughly transformed into a different kind of person so that I reflect the character of Jesus Christ. So this is what being a follower of Jesus means. Now, there is a traditional model that uh, on a folklore level, people embrace without knowing it. And it goes something like this, that baptism plus time plus individual will and hard work means that you will be saved when Jesus comes. And this is based on the fact that life takes change before baptism. So if you want to be baptized, you need to be almost perfect. The level of your sanctification needs to be to a certain degree. You cannot struggle with this or that. And then when you reach this level, then we are going to baptize you. And then if you just continue over your lifetime, you will be sinning less and less. And the sanctification will take over. This is achieved by, by, mostly, largely by trying harder. So if you see someone who still struggles, you know, they have not given up smoking or they have a problem with drinking, you say, oh, come on, you need to try harder. And this is achieved mostly alone in a private relationship with God. So you don't need other people for that, because if you pray hard and uh, pray harder and read the Bible or LNG white writings longer, then it will happen. It happens to you as an individual. And the result is then you will be saved. Now, what is the biblical model? 
the biblical model says that the conversion or being born from above is only the beginning of life change. That's why it's called new birth. Life is what happens after the birth. So it's only the beginning. And what is the goal of it? Somebody asked, teacher, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. It's on the same level. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. In our alphabet, we put the letters on the line. But in Hebrew alphabet, they hang from above. So we put the line is at the bottom in our languages. But in Hebrew, it's at the top. And the letters hang. So that's why Jesus says, so here's the bottom line. God is not interested in some abstract thing called your spiritual life. God is interested in your life, full stop, period. And that's why he wants you to be filled with love, love for him, love for other people and care for other people, as Karen so beautifully explained to us. And if that is not happening, then religion is not happening in our lives. Ellen White said, the best argument for Christianity is loving and lovable Christians. Frank Lobach, who was a missionary, American missionary, probably the only missionary who got a stamp. There is a U.S. stamp with Frank Lobach. He said, a simple program of Christ for winning the whole world is to make each person he touches so magnetic with love that they will draw others to Jesus. So... Conversion is the beginning of life change. Life change takes intention, not just time, so that you become a loving person. It's not just going to happen by rounding hours, years as a Christian. 90% of children who grew up in American Christian homes prayed the prayer to receive Christ into their heart. Yet, only 20% 2% or one-fifth of those who received Christ as children into their heart show any marks of following Christ or attending church by the age of 35. So obviously, that prayer did not work magically because for 78% it didn't make any difference. Simply being exposed to information doesn't mean that people will absorb it, understand it, embrace it, or put into practice in their lives. So this is this folklore a misunderstanding. If we just give people the information, then it's going to make difference in their lives. It doesn't work like that. 80% of people who are claiming to be born again Christians have no idea that Great Commission defines what the church is all about. 80% of people say the church is there to serve my needs so that I am happy, I am satisfied. Give me better sermons, better parking, better children's story, fulfill my needs. So here is the biblical model. Being born again is just the beginning. You need to be intentional about being a loving person. And you achieve it not by trying harder, but by training. So spiritual transformation, being a loving person, being a follower of Jesus, being a disciple of Jesus, is not a matter of trying harder, but a matter of wise training. There is a limit what you can achieve by trying harder. Yesterday was the London Marathon. If you never run a marathon, don't even try because you cannot achieve running a marathon 42 kilometers or 26 miles by trying harder. It doesn't work like that. Training means to arrange your life around activities which you can do that will enable you over a period of time to do something that cannot be done by direct effort alone. Unless you have a heart condition, each one of us could run a marathon one year or two years from now. If we arrange our activities in such a way that over a period of time we can do something that we cannot do by direct uh, effort, by trying harder today, tomorrow, next week. Training is an in indispensable ingredient for pursuing spiritual transformation, for being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so the goal is to be loving, as we said. 
the purpose of our activities of involving people is not to demonstrate how spiritual we are, to prove something to ourselves or to someone else, but to be more loving. In all activities that we do, there's only one purpose, to help us to grow in love for God and other people, to become more loving, Christ-like in all aspects of our life. So if I go and do shopping for groceries today and I end up in being in the longest line because I miscalculated the number of items in the trolley of somebody and the speed through which the, the girl at the cash register is working, then I can take that instead of being upset as maybe God is trying to teach me patience right now. And I can learn something that helps me to be more loving person. A loving person does the right thing at the right time in the right way from the right motives. And it's so easy to feel smug and superior about other, about other people and to forget that, okay, am I doing the right thing? But even if I am doing the right thing, I am doing it at the right time because doing the right thing at the wrong time is not very loving. Am I doing it in the right way? And even if I have succeeded doing the right thing at the right time in the right way, Am I doing it from the right motives? Because if not, then it's not accomplishing what God wants me to do. So, yes, by deciding to follow Jesus, we embark on the life of change that will take intention to become loving. And you achieve it by training and not by trying harder. So being involved in whatever is just a way of making us more loving people. And this only happens when you are involved with other people. So it was never God's intention that we reach our potential alone. You actually cannot reach your potential alone. It was never God's intention that we face life alone. And therefore, when we are converted, God sends us to be part of a community. Community is what we want the most, what we lack the most, and what we fear the most. Because just as iron shapes another iron, community shapes us to become the people God wants us to be. And so this is the way how God shapes us. And so we need to replace that uh, equation with conversion plus intentionality plus training plus community become, means life change and involvement in the community is how God is shaping each one, of, each one of us today. So this is the rethinking of the discipleship. What, why are we here? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? When I said yes to Jesus, when I got baptized, what did I sign up for? And most people don't realize that this is what it means, that I intentionally will allow different activities that I perform together with other people to shape me to be a more loving person and thus follower of Jesus. He said, I am among you as one who serves. All right, the second thing we need to redefine, rethink is evangelism. Now there are three steps to evangelism. The first one is bridge building. Most people don't care about God, about Christian message. And it's not because they are bad people it's not that they don't want God or Christianity in their life. They just don't see a purpose for it. They don't see it relevant. Somebody said so well, Christianity is like a fish to a bicycle. For a contemporary person, Christianity is like a fish to a bicycle. A bicycle is a wonderful thing, but why would a fish need one? And so caring relationships, as Karen said, are the key. Yet in thinking of many people, Adventists, their insulation from others is a measure of their sanctification and the commitment to Jesus. They don't want to have anything to do with people and the world around them. The ideal is to disappear somewhere in the middle of nowhere so that we are ready for, trans, for, me, for translation when Jesus comes. The second, so if, unless you build bridges with people, you are not showing caring and love to them and you cannot win them and you are not going to be involved in that. As I say, you do it by proxy, you do it from afar. You give them the great controversy book, hear this, read this, and if you don't see the truth, 
obviously you are not a sincere person, something wrong with you. But don't ask me to be caring for you because that is messy. I think Heather mentioned that very nicely in the discussion after our last lecture presentation. The second step is how do you say to people what you've got? How can you say in terms that can be understood by others that actually not only I do care for you, but I have something to share with you. So when people enjoy that caring relationship, how do you say to them, actually, I gave you five euros, but actually I have 1000 euros. I have more to share than this. And then how do we invite them to an environment where they can safely explore what it means to be a Christian? Who is God? What does he offer? How do you give them a chance to explore something that is clear on, and this is who God is, and this is what he offers humanity. This is what he offers to each one of us. And all these three steps are important because you cannot have number three without number one or two. Okay, you can print uh, one million handouts or posters or bills that invites people that invite people to evangelistic series on the book of revelation but you know in our environment how many people will respond to that because you start with step number 3 it doesn't work like that so just as god gave us four gospels because he knew very well that one gospel could not reach every everybody there are six different styles of evangelism and witnessing in the new testament that are mentioned because it takes all kinds of Christians to, le to reach all kinds of non-believers. And the first one, the one that most people associate with evangelism is so-called confrontational style. A good example is a Peter in the book of Acts in chapter two, he preached on the day of Pentecost and he said, you guys are in trouble because God sent his Messiah and you nailed him to the cross. So you better repent because you are in big trouble. A good verse from the Bible would be 2 Timothy 4.2, preach the word, be prepared in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage. Now, here's an important thing. You cannot exhort an unencouraged person. That's why what Karen was talking about, the caring community, is the first step. You cannot tell people the truth unless you have cared for them. And what, what uh, characterizes this style is confident, bold, and direct. And sometimes people need to hear that. But there is time and there is place for this. Where you need to be cautious, you need to be cautious that you seek God's wisdom to be sensitive and tactful. Paul says in Ephesians, speak truth in love. Because if you are not speaking truth in love, you can abuse your style of evangelism. But it has a place, and some of you have this style of serving others. Then there is an intellectual style, and a good example is Paul in Acts 15 in Athens. He says, I was walking around, and we read in the text that his spirit was greatly agitated about the idols, Yet when he opens his mouth, he says, you know, guys, there is something about you which I admire. You take your religion very seriously. So let me tell you something about that God. The theme text would be a good theme text would be 2 Corinthians 10, 5. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And the quote characterizes this style is inquisitive, analytical, logical, can help people see the steps. If you follow this, if you believe this, if you live like this, these are the consequences. This is what you are going to encounter. But where do you need to be cautious? You need to remember that attitude is as important as information. Notice how Paul is positive towards them. When did you say to the uh, Jehovah's Witness the last time, you know, I admire how seriously you take your religion. When did you say to a Muslim person, I admire how prayer is important to you. Don't become overly argumentative. The goal is not to win the battle. The goal is to win people. The third one is testimonial. The blind man in John 9, remember? Are you asking me because you guys want to become the disciples of Jesus as well? 
I don't know these arguments in theology. I don't know how you trained Pharisees and theologians think, but I know one thing. I was blind, but now I can see. John says in 1 John 1, 3, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. So these characteristics are someone who can clearly communicate. Imagine a blind man from birth, that means he never went to school, he never learned how to read, and he can talk to these PhDs and put things succinctly. What is the essence here of the problem? So he's a, obviously a good listener. He can read the situation, though he can't see. Now, where a person like this needs to be cautious, you need to relate the, your experience to the life of your listener. Otherwise, you will be just talking about yourself. So that's not the goal. The fourth one is interpersonal style. Matthew, when he or Levi, when he is invited by Jesus, Jesus comes to this tax collector and says to him, you follow me. And he does. But then he has friends who are tax collectors. And he does not know how to explain, like Paul at uh, Aeropagus in, Math in uh, Athens, the theology to him. So he just does one thing. He organizes a party, because that's what he did before. And he invites all his friends and says, and Jesus will do the rest. He will explain to them. 1 Corinthians 9, 22, I have become all things to all men, so that by all possible means I might save some. What characterizes this is compassionate, sensitive, conversational. And he invites all his tax collectors and says, I am curious to see how the rabbi is going to deal with them. Where you need to be cautious, when you start valuing, when you start bending the truth because you don't want to lose real friendships, you know that you are going too far. So make sure that you keep the friendship and the truth in proper balance. And the, the, uh, the penultimate one is the number five, is invitational style. The Samaritan woman in John 4, we had it in the Sabbath school lesson a few weeks ago. She, can you imagine how the city was looking down on her? That's why she goes to the well at noon, not to meet all the saints from the local church, from the local village. And she meets the most holy one. And then she goes back. And instead of putting one, she puts it in such a way, you guys owe it to yourself unless you meet that man. She can go and invite people in such a way that they really go and explore Jesus. They want to meet him. He told me everything I have done, yet he treated me like a queen. So this is the person who enjoys meeting new people, who is hospitable, and who can point to Jesus without embarrassing people. And instead of saying, so... Do you know who is the Messiah? Who met the Messiah? The one that you guys despise. No, she does it in such a way that they want to meet Jesus. And they come and meet him and say, now we believe not because of what you said, but because of our own experience with this Jesus. Where you need to be cautious, do not let others do all the talking for you. So she's incredibly capable with her words she knows how to put things so that people themselves are interested in jesus and the last one is the serving style dorcas in acts 9 when she dies her deeds speak for themselves so that people realize how much they are missing and they praise the father in heaven so here is someone who is other centered patient humble other oriented who is willing to do acts for, of kindness for other people. Where you need to be cautious is that you can use actions as a substitute for words and you don't bother to verbalize what you feel and what you believe because your actions are so clear. No, they are both important, both actions and the words. So here are the six styles of witnessing, confrontational, intellectual, testimonial, interpersonal, invitational, and serving style. Here's the question. How can the understanding and experiencing various evangelistic styles be liberating for each one of us? So that you don't try to be Peter on the day of Pentecost if this is not you. What would an understanding of your personal style of witnessing look like? 
how that would help you to see the diversity that God has built into the body of Christ, that we are all different and we are not all the same and we don't need to be all the same. How can you affirm that diversity? How can we teach it to other people so they become liberated and they don't try to be someone God did not create them to be? How can we live it out so that we each have something to contribute? And how can we celebrate it? How can you, I say to someone else, when you do this, I am blessed? Because we all have different style. And the last one, so we need to rethink discipleship, we need to rethink evangelism, and we need to rethink the process. The ministry in the New Testament is based on spiritual gifts. When you serve with your spiritual gift, you will be invigorated, you will be blessed, other people will be blessed. Now, we can all substitute for a spiritual gift for a short time. If someone knocks on my door at midnight because they are hungry, I don't tell them, okay, come back when you need to explain Daniel 7 and I will tell you what the beasts represent or Revelation 13. But what percentage of our people actually do know what is their spiritual gift? And if you don't know what is your spiritual gift, you will try to serve in the wrong way. If I start singing or playing the piano, probably nobody is going to be blessed. Now, here's an important aspect. In the New Testament, everybody needs to have faith. But there are some people who have the gift of faith. It's not the same. Everybody believes, but there are some people who have the gift of faith and can see things today which do not exist, but will be the reality next week, next year, five years from now. That's a gift of faith. The same with prayer. All of us pray, but some people have a gift of prayer. They can formulate ideas in such a way that when they pray, you and I are blessed. And the same is with witnessing. All of us need to say, and this is what Jesus did for me. And this is how I experienced my relationship with God. But only five to six percent of members have the gift of evangelism. So we all have different styles of how we can wrap our witnessing for other people. But the actual gift of cross-cultural ministry is only five to six percent of the body of Christ. So what does the ministry and involvement of members in the process will look like? It will depend on your spiritual gift. Which way of serving energizes you? For me, to take a thick theological book and to make it simple is something that energizes me. I am always thinking, how could I express this complex theological truth in a simple way so that everybody can understand. I was saying, oh, come on, do you want me to read 300 pages of this book? Who cares about that? No, that's what energizes me. What do others see in you that brings them blessing? What do people say to you, when you do this or this, I feel blessed? Because that's where you probably have the spiritual gift. When you ask the question, how come that nobody sees that? Probably the answer is because you have a spiritual gift in that area and people who don't have the gift, they just don't see the problem. The fact that you see the problem that something is wrong tells you that you have a spiritual gift in that area. Now, you can have the gift of teaching and you can teach in the kindergarten. You can teach on a, a Sabbath morning in the Sabbath school. You can teach BA or MA level or you can teach on a doctoral level. So the second one is, what is your passion? Who are you passionate about? What are you passionate about? What makes you tick? Because if it's small children, then maybe you should teach them. And if it's postgraduate students, somebody needs to do something for them and bless them. When do you get excited? What is evangelism that looks like you? What is your style? Thirdly, what is your personality? What would be the ministry that looks like you so that you flourish? You say, yeah, when I do this, 
I feel the pleasure of God, to quote Eric Liddell from the famous movie. Which place of service would truly energize you? And the last, what is the place that God has for you? Where is the parquet where you can make the greatest contribution? So once you consider this, your spiritual gifts, your passion, your evangelistic or witnessing styles, your personality, your type of ministry, then you will see where you can get involved. Is there anything that you need to change to make that happen? Because otherwise, either you will feel we need to bribe people or we need to scare them into getting involved. So we need to rethink the whole process. And how do we do that? Spirit anointed teaching is the way how God changes people in 21st century. It was like that in early church. It is like that. It was like that during the Reformation. It is like that today. Long term change requires a change of thinking. You can inspire people short term but then it will fade away. If you want to change their thinking long-term, then you need to do some teaching, explain to them how things work in God's kingdom. You need to put emphasis on relationships. Life change happens in the context of relationships and uh, in small groups, in caring environment, unconditional acceptance, Karen was speaking about that, and that's why we experience God's grace through relationships. By people we are hurt, by people we are healed. And if you say, I don't need that, I just, me and my sweet Jesus is enough, then the words of J.B. Phillips are so true. Your God is too small. Our God works, exists in relationships as Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he works through relationships. Discipleship has to do with the love and the, through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So what attributes is God trying? How is he going trying to teach me to be more loving, to be more joyful, to be more patient? And what all the fruits of Holy Spirit is God trying to produce in my life today through me being involved, even in, in something that I might not enjoy the most today, but actually is developing me and my character into something greater. Spiritual practices and disciples disciplines are essential. So are you just a consumer? Give me, give me, give me. You can't win over the sin, the world and the devil with people who just say, give me, give me, give me, give me. Jesus says, I am among you as one who serves. He left heaven to serve us when he realized that he came from the father he was returning to the Father. He allowed his disciples to the end. He decided to serve them. He took the lowest position and served his disciples. So you will need to invest. We are not prescribing how. We are not promoting a program. Just tell me, where do you invest in other people? Because if you don't, you are not a follower of Jesus. You are just burying your talent in the ground. What are the needs of people around you? Ministry starts with needs. We spoke about this in, the, in Lithuania in January. The disciple is one who has a heart for serving others and a strategy for listening to the needs need to be in place. Do you see the need? How can we fulfill that need? And so if you start with the new birth, you're intentional and you train other people, then together we can change the world, we can change the local community, and we can change the world. That was God's intention. So, conclusion. So what? Kingdom life is the only life worth living. Live to the fullest, use the gifts that you got to serve others. Don't get discouraged when things do not work out the way you planned or expected. The apathy of people around you does not need to determine how you live. For the sake of kingdom, be the best person you can be. Get involved. 
One day you will be happy that you did. You will hear from Jesus himself, well done, good and faithful servant. Remember, you are unique. Use it for God. Enjoy it. And the concluding thought, remember there is no quick fix. There is no simple, easy solution. Even Rome wasn't built in a day. Jesus says in Mark 4, 20 to 8, first the stalk, then the head, and then the full kernel in the head. We are not there today, but we'll be better off tomorrow, one year from now, and when Jesus comes, we will be there.